Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I teach history at Suffolk University and also chair of the Rev 250 advisory group. We're a collaboration among 70 or so organizations looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution. And our guest today is Colin G. Calloway, who is one of the foremost historians of the founding period, and his focus has been Native Americans in the founding, and of course, Native American history in America. He is the uh, John Kimball Jr. 1943 professor at Dartmouth. He's a professor of history and a professor of Native American studies at Dartmouth, and the author of at least a dozen books, mainly focusing on Native American history. Is One of his most recent is The Indian World of George Washington. And he also wrote The American Revolution in Indian Country, well, close to 30 years ago now, which looks at Native, you know, Native Americans as really a center of the American Revolution. Or how, well, welcome, Professor Calloway. Thank you, Bob, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, how would we, how do, does looking at the American Revolution from the perspective of Native Americans change the way we understand it? Or looking at Washington through the lens of his, his long involvement with Native Americans. How does that change our way of thinking about these things? Yeah, I think it obviously complements how we think about things. And I think with, there's a tendency, of course, and maybe particularly with the revolution, because it's so central to our, and when I say our, I mean this, this society and this, this country's sense, uh, not only of its history, but of its, of its identity. Um, and I think you don't have to be doing Native American history to look at the revolution to very quickly find yourself saying it's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And obviously, <clears throat> therefore, ignoring Native people, Native Americans in their story, not only makes it a, a rather lopsided and a, a, a kind of a, a shallow tale, but I also think mis misrepresents it because the American Revolution was. Um, it's a war for independence, it's a war for freedom, but it's also a war about Indian land and who is going to have access to that land, who's going to have first dibs on that land, uh, how that land is going to be transformed from tribal homelands into um, American property, American real estate. Um, so that's a key part of it. And I think it, if, if we don't recognize that, first of all, we miss some of the motivating factors in the revolution, but also then um, cannot understand what Native Americans are doing. Mm -hmm. And so we go readily to the Declaration of Independence. Right. That tells us what they were doing. They were... Yeah bad hombres on the wrong side and they were murdering innocent women and children and i think that there's a especially these days as we're in a political climate where um the things that people like us and i'm talking about all of us in this audience the things that people like us do and teach is not only dismissed we're used to that or ignored but it's you know, in some, in some quarters, it, it's um, there's an active hostility uh, towards mm -hmm. it uh, because our view of the revolution should be about this This was a war for freedom. Well, my answer to that is, um, yes, it was a war for freedom, but there are different kinds of freedom, and freedom can mean different things to different people. And the Native Americans in this war are fighting to protect their land, obviously, but they're also fighting for freedom as they understand it. Mm -hmm. And I think if we just um, adjust the focus on our view of freedom a little bit to include other perspectives and other experiences, like enslaved people who sought freedom by running to the British lines, which seems to be 
the opposite of freedom as as, as, as we view the revolution on Native Americans to pitch their um, struggle as their, their own war of freedom instead of them being endlessly pitted or portrayed in the revolution as people who opposed freedom at the mm -hmm. moment of the country's birth. And I don't think that that's upending our understanding of the revolution or um, threatening that that hell of story. It just enriches it and makes it what, like most human struggles, are a complicated and multifaceted uh, experience where everybody involved deserves um, attention and inclusion to the extent that we can on their terms. And mm -hmm. obviously, not being native, that's somewhat presumptuous on my part. But I think you can often go a long way to understanding people's experiences simply by positioning yourself where they were on the map. Mm -hmm. I think the American Revolution from the Ohio country looks quite different than it does from Boston. It does. And the um, there are a lot of different Native Americans that you've written about. And they have yeah. different responses to what's happening in 1760 and 1770. If we could talk a little bit about some of these different ways, you know, different nations or people actually responded to the events then happening in 1760 and 70. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's one of my perpetual fascinations in um, looking at the history of this country and writing the books that, that I do and the, teaching the classes that I do. Because um, if we think of Native people simply as the Indians, then you've got a block. And so American history works as a story of white people moving west and pushing into and pushing aside a block that is Native American group. And what I like to do, and I do it in my classes all the time, I like to draw a, uh, a wheel, or the equivalent of a wheel, a hub with spokes on the board. And the central hub I will put in the Dawnies, or Osage, or Comanche, or Lakota, depending on which area of the country we're talking about. And then there will be multiple spokes from that center, including um, that, that show their connections to the British, the Spanish, the Americans, and then multiple other nations. Because I truly believe that people do not see themselves on the edge of somebody else's frontier or the edges of something right. else's experience. We all live at the center of our own right. universe. And I think for native peoples the native nations, if we think of them as nations, they are in the center of a world in which they have multiple often evolving relations with other nations. And some of those nations are European, but most of those nations are indigenous nations. And so they're not going to make decisions simply based on an understanding of themselves as on the western edge of a, of a white world. It's, it's much more appropriate, I think, to look at them at the center of that universe and to understand, of course, that all of those relations are changing. And the one thing that that does, I think, which I, I really advocate strongly, is to say, well, how did those that how did that nation, whoever it is, Shawnee or Comanche, deal with all the nations around them? They did it through what we would call foreign policy, which is a term that we don't often ascribe to Native Americans, but of course they do. Once you designate them as individual nations, then those individual nations have foreign policies. And those foreign right. policies will shift and change over time, etc. But once you've opened that can of worms, you yeah. simply cannot talk about Indian white relations in, in the same way. Mm 
and I think that's productive and a uh, and a, an important step forward. It is. So the Shawnee are not necessarily just thinking about either the Americans or the English. They're also thinking about their neighbors and the other people that they've been dealing with, you know, historically. Yeah. And they're thinking about their internal politics sure. yeah. in order to forge these relations. I mean, we know from our own society that um, well, what historians like to call when looking at Native American groups is factions. Mm -hmm. split and divided, etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, we know how that works. Right, um, yeah. And so it, it, it's complicated within as well, because there were, of course, divisions and changing um, attitudes and opinions about how to conduct relations with other people, mm -hmm. including the Americans. Right. We're, we're talking with Colin Calloway, professor of history and the John Kimball Jr. 1943 professor at Dartmouth College, um, about some of his books on Native Americans and the revolution. You know, by the way, in 1908, the Congress of the United States designated the Battle of Point Pleasant, which is now West Virginia, as the first battle of the American Revolution. Mm. Um, for reasons that I think are a bit lost to me, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the Shawnee, Lord Dunmore's war as a precursor, if it is, to the revolution. Sure. Um, I've always found Shawnee history particularly um, fascinating, <clears throat> in large part because of where they are, um, mm -hmm. where they find themselves, which is not always in the same place they're on the move a yeah. lot of the time um, but it also almost seems to me that Shawnee history is a little bit like the history of Poland right? if you're positioned in a certain place mm -hmm. you, it's almost like you seem to be in the middle of a four lane highway right? and I think for Shawnee people who buy the 1760s, 1770s had been scattered and dispersed, had been traveling, moving, and are beginning to um, reconvene in what were traditional homelands. Um, they find themselves kind of in the crosshairs of American colonial expansion. Mm -hmm. And it comes to a, a crisis, I think, with the um, was a treaty after the Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1768, when Sir William Johnson makes a treaty with the Iroquois, with the Haudenosaunee, that essentially agrees to shift the boundary established by the British Royal Proclamation of 1763 westward. The proclamation had set that boundary at the Appalachian Mount, Mountains, basically saying west of that is an, is an Indian reserve. And access to lands there will be only through the Crown's official agents, etc., etc. Well, right from the beginning, there'd been pressure to move that land, move that boundary. Uh, pressure from uh, um, important elements in colonial society, some of the important individuals in colonial society who become key players in the American Revolution and founding fathers because they were doing what, what was big business in the 18th century. Business in the 18th century was about getting land, getting Indian land. Um, and in 1768, Johnson negotiated a treaty whereby the Iroquois agreed to shift the line westward, kind of down the Ohio River. And I think that was a masterstroke on the part of the Iroquois because what they essentially did there was not to block the expansion of Anglo-American, Euro-American uh, migration, which would have, uh, could otherwise have gone up across New York, which was Iroquois homeland. They kind of diverted it south, south of the Ohio River. Well, that was not Iroquois homeland. It was Iroquois territory based on earlier claims, but it was essentially Shawnee hunting territory and Shawnee mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. So in the wake of that, the Shawnees basically are 
beginning to move toward their own independence from both the British and the Iroquois, who seem to have cooked up these deals to dispossess the Shawnee of their lands. Right? Um, and oh, let me excuse me very quickly. Sorry about that. I realize I'm the only person in the house. <laughs> um, so that there's, after 1768, there's an influx of people moving into what is now Kentucky, et cetera, et cetera. Um, many of them convinced that they have the right to do that because these lands have been opened for settlement by the Treaty of Fort Sandwich. And they meet Shawnees who are convinced that they are there illegally because the Shawnees were not at the Treaty of Fort Stanwyx, did not agree mm -hmm. to it. Um, and so you have this uh, situation where it's extremely volatile. This is when you know, mm -hmm. Daniel Boone's getting himself captured by Shawnees and all of this kind of right. thing going on. Yeah. But of course, a major player in all of this is Virginia, looking mm -hmm. towards its western boundaries, looking towards the Ohio Valley and pressuring, um, adding to the pressure on Shawnee land with many people in Virginia, especially elite people in Virginia, looking to that as an area of investment, settlement, etc. Mm -hmm. Things come to a head in 17, uh, in the early 70s, and particularly are sparked by a, there's a massacre of uh, a Native American group uh, at a place called Baker's Bottom on Yellow Creek, um, which is interesting because it reveals not only hostility, but also patterns of coexistence. It seems that Indian people, a group of Indian people were invited over to the river, to come have a drink, mm -hmm. and did that without any suspicion. Yeah. That seems to have been uh, a fairly regular pattern. Right? Right. But in the wake of that, um, a group of let's call them frontier thugs massacre this Indian extended family, mm -hmm. uh, committing some you know, pretty horrific atrocities. Yeah. And that event prompts um, an Indian by the name of Logan, known as the mm -hmm. English as Logan, to go on a kind of campaign of vengeance. He actually. Um, apparently kills as many people as family members he lost at the massacre. This is a very you know, culturally mandated Im imperative to exact that vengeance. Um, and Logan's lament, of course, is famous as recorded right. in Jefferson's notes in the state of Virginia. Mm -hmm. Having done that, he then said, okay, vengeance is satisfied. But many people, Pennsylvanians at the time, and many historians since have said, this gave Lord Dunmore of Virginia and his associates the green light they needed to go to war against the, the Shawnees mm -hmm. um, as punishment for this um, for these Indian raids, mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of creates the context for the sending the the armies into uh, Shawnee country and the and the Battle of Point Pleasant, which after which. Cornstalk and the Shawnees kind of reluctantly at the Treaty of uh, Camp Shell agree to acknowledge the loss of their lands south of the Ohio River. So in that sense, you could say, well, um, did it do much more than confirm the Treaty of, uh, of, of uh, Fort Sandwich? But it, what's happening is that because of that treaty and the wedge that it opened into kind of the center of Indian country, mm -hmm. what is now you know, Kentucky largely, the, the, the escalating tensions seem to focus on that, on that point. And of course, Dunmore's war is, is scarcely over than Dunmore's, well, up to his ears in all kinds of issues mm -hmm. uh, at the start of the, the, the American Revolution. So you can almost, uh, if you can't track a direct line to the revolution, mm 
the edges of Dunmore's war and the outbreak of the revolution get very fuzzy. I think. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, General Gage, when he's, uh, before he comes to Boston, his real focus isn't what's happening in these cities, but it's what's happening in, in Illinois or mm -hmm. Ohio. I mean, this is really the area the English, the British are thinking about in terms of the future of North America, as opposed to these um, colonies on the coast. Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, reading all of that correspondence and it and it carries over too into into the american era i guess after the revolution is this is the area that people are looking to for that with, with their vision of the future mm -hmm. so when the Br british defeat the french in 1763 and they acquire this massive empire mm -hmm. stretching all the way to the mississippi there's there's jubilation, there's church bells ringing, and there's British officials thinking, and now what the hell do we do with it? How yeah. do we administer an empire of this size? Mm -hmm. How do we um, manage it in a way that it's not going to be a perpetual bloodbath? Yeah. And, and of course, immediately after 1763, you get Pontiac's war mm -hmm. against the British, this prompts the a proclamation mm -hmm. and it also of course prompts the british to keep troops in north america right which is expensive mm -hmm. which somebody's got to pay for right mm -hmm. and the british can't afford any more taxes because they're bankrupt on at the end of a long mm -hmm. war against france how about we get the american colonists to pay their share right. of the taxes mm -hmm. well we all know how well that worked out yeah. But so much of, I think, the roots of the revolutionary ferment, if you like, um, lie in the West. And for the British policymakers and the imperial officials, the West is particularly worrying because it is this scene of perpetual unrest and turmoil. And they don't just blame the Indians for that. In fact, they often blame the people living on the frontier who were not Indian for that. And this is something that George Washington and the, the American government uh, takes up. The notion that the white people who are out there on the frontier, I'm actually now writing a book on the Scotch-Irish invasion of Indian country. And many of these people are Scotch-Irish, um, are reputed to be these unruly elements that destabilize the frontier that that pull off massacres and create uh, you know, yeah. cause indian wars well again if we if we read that if, if uh, there's a parallel here in how we understand native american experience if we just read about the scotch irish people on the frontier from the perspective of government officials in london philadelphia or washington they look a lot like Indians. They actually describe them as that. They say these people are worse than the savages. But if we put them, if we just look at what's going on from where they are, then we see these people who view themselves as, in many ways, victims because they've been encouraged to move out there to act as a buffer against possible Native American assault and attack. Which means that when the wars break out, they're the first people to get it in the neck. And they will then look to the government that sent them there and say, help. And petitions asking for arms and um, armed soldiers and defenses, etc. And when the governments don't provide those, then those people are often as hostile in their attitudes towards their own government as they are toward Indian people. Um, and I think there are sentiments there that we can see in our own in our own times. Um, so I think that um, what to me I would say that what what you characterize as, as the West and Illinois country and Ohio country these are very often depicted as areas kind of beyond the pale, you know, and, and it's this empty wilderness, etc. 
but I think for for us as historians, they're incredibly busy places. There's an awful lot going on there. And a lot of the things that, uh, that are happening that affect and determine the course of American history have their roots there. Mm. As people are struggling to sort things out in an area where lots of people are competing for competing for control, but nobody has control. Right. We're, we're, we're talking with Colin Calloway, uh, professor of history at Dartmouth College, author of numerous books on Native Americans and the revolution. And uh, just thinking about the Scots-Irish on the frontier, I was also drawn thinking about people like Alexander McGilvray, who is the Creek right. leader, who actually does have Scottish ancestry and Again, another way of looking about the, at these folks who are on the frontier, who are encountering one another in different ways in this area where a lot of things are happening, and it is a really thickly people area. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you look at um, people like Alexander McGillivray, um, who is a son of Scottish traders, right, and many of the traders among the Creeks and Cherokees uh, were descended from, from Scots traders. Um, but they were Creek and they were Cherokee because they inherited their <clears throat> tribal identity through the maternal line, <clears throat> excuse me, which is what gave them their membership in their clans. And that's what determined who they were. But they also have these connections and experiences and very often education in Euro-American society. So they become important players, not only in Greek politics, you, I mean, you can look at them and say, so these are, this is a new class, if you like, of indigenous leadership, and they're not traditional, and they're perhaps not representing their people in traditional ways. Perhaps some people within those societies might have regarded them as usurpers. However, they are, fulfilling an important function because they are ideally equipped to be the front men in dealing with the people whom the Creeks and the Cherokees, etc., have to deal more and more, and that is European or Euro-American traders, government officials, military officers, etc., etc., because they know the ropes. Right? And so... Again, as we look, if we look at a map and think of this somewhere like Creek Country in Georgia and Alabama as being a, a nexus of empires colliding, where you've got the British and the Spanish and then the American, the United States and the British and the Spanish all competing with their eyes very much <clears throat> on the Creek because the Creek Confederacy is the major power in the area on the ground the people it's people like mcgillivray who are on the on the ground who actually know what's going on because they're talking to spanish they're talking to british they're talking to um the united states and the millet mcgillivray's case um operating a pretty savvy playoff system right? which to the you know as we were talking before we started, Bob, I spent my, a lot of my time going through British records um, mm -hmm. in, in London. And the number of times I've, I saw British officers or officials describing Indians as fickle. Hmm. You know, you, you, you wow. can't rely on these people. They, they do whatever they want. Well, of course they do whatever they want, because what are they doing? They're pursuing their own foreign policies, right. not yours. Right? And right, those foreign right. policies will shift according to what they are hearing from the, you know, this, this lady Spanish governor that McGillivray has spoken to, or the way the map of North America is changing, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so you get individuals like McGillivray, Joseph Brandt, or even Sir William Johnson in the North, who, who dies right. before the revolution. These are a little bit like people in the position of almost marcher lords in the British borderlands, right? Yeah. They are supposed to represent 
they're supposed to rent one set of interests, but they represent multiple sets of interests, not yeah. least in many cases their own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sir William Johnson certainly does, and yeah. he um, has a long relationship with Molly Brandt, who's another mm -hmm. fascinating figure in this. And then uh, Joseph Brandt is her brother. Yeah. Yeah. And Joseph Brandt is a fascinating individual, um, because of course in the uh, American sources at the time and in American historiography for certainly a, a century after the American Revolution, um, century more, he's depicted as, as Monster Brandt who did these horrible things on the on the frontier of New frontiers of New York and Pennsylvania, etc., as he was a prominent uh, Mohawk war chief. Um, but he's also um, an educated um, through the auspices of Sir William Johnson. He received an education uh, from Eliezer Wheelock, the, the founder of Dartmouth College. He didn't come to Dartmouth College, but he went to Wheelock's previous school. Um, he was a member of the Church of England. He worked in translating gospels into Mohawk. Um, and he his portrait was done by Sir George Romney, right? His yes, had his, had his portrait painted not once, but many times. And I've yeah. seen a lot of Joseph Brandt portrait, but not long ago, I was reading something which I can't verify where the author, um, stipulated that Brandt had had his portrait painted or his picture done, his portrait done 39 times in his lifetime. Wow. Well, if wow. you think about the 18th century, you know, yeah. you've got your portrait done if you were a big deal, right? Yeah. This is not like taking a selfie. Right? Right. Yeah. This involved yeah. as an investment of time, money, etc. So it's a testimony to his importance mm -hmm. and his perceived importance in uh in other circles and he also writes in a good hand i often remember um when going through the correspondence of the british indian department in in london when i was cutting my teeth on this stuff if i if i'd see a joseph you, you learn to identify the handwriting i'd see a, a joseph brandt letter coming up and it would almost be like a sigh of relief because right. i could read his handwriting yeah because he'd been trained to write mm -hmm. by Eliza Wheeler right. and some of yeah. these other guys in the British Indian oh, department. Yeah. Um, oh, you yeah. just had to assume they were dry, they were writing when they were drunk because it looked like <laughs> it. Um, but it, the other thing it means is that people like Brandt and McGillivray, who are these indigenous mm -hmm. leaders, are equipped to not only read and write and deal with outsiders but also to engage in to understand the debate mm -hmm. about freedom and liberty and all of this mm -hmm. stuff that's yeah. going on this this if you like this intellectual ferment where right. these issues are being debated mm -hmm. these guys are not you know primitive leaders whose only response to something is to pick up a tomahawk right? they read they write um and they're they're aware of what's going on have i lost you bob i'm not I, I I can hear you now. Okay. I think we're okay. back. Yeah, so I can't hear you're you. Talking about, okay. Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. You were, you were talking about these guys who read and write. They're part of this um, world. People like Brandt, McGillivray. That was the last yeah. thing I heard. I mean, you think about Joseph Brandt. Joseph Brandt, um, by, you know, 1780 six seven seven he's been to london twice mm. well george washington never went to london right that's right yeah. so i mean if we're thinking about you know there's, um there's people um who are i don't know if cosmopolitan is the right word right? yeah 
but these guys move in important circles certainly brown mm -hmm. does um yeah. and that's a so again that idea that we can draw a line mm -hmm. between yes. the white world and the native world i mean more and more scholars these days are exploring and tracing the experiences of native people who crossed the atlantic and went to europe right well yeah. one of the things that happens then when they do that they're doing their own voyages of discovery That's uh, true. and yeah. looking at things for the first mm -hmm. time and looking at experiencing them in in their own ways and uh, mm -hmm. and carrying with them and this is something that i explored a little bit in in the last book that i did their own attitudes and their own ideas of what constitutes civilization yes and if you find yourself in 18th century london um yeah there might be a lot of things that are impressive but there are a lot of things that it would be one would be hard pressed to think of this as civilized society you know, from mm -hmm. native people's perspectives the dirt the hunger mm -hmm. the, the poverty of the people in the street um that wasn't that was um that was not how uh society was supposed to function right we're, we're talking with colin calloway professor of history at dartmouth college i'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about samson Ockham, Ockham the mm -hmm. new england um he's another of these figures he writes and he's also part of this um interconnectivity i don't know how we want to call it he corresponds with phyllis wheatley and others um if we could talk a little bit about you know this side of the story yeah yeah that's a good point but um um you mentioned my uh, sort of overview textbook that i've done i'm, I'm just finishing the revisions for the, for the next edition and they like to do a we like you to do these little picture essays, actually, right. because it was my idea. I shouldn't say they like me. I should take blame for it myself. But one of the things I'm doing in this one is a picture essay built around the idea of, I think I call it revolutionary leaders and founding fathers. Because mm -hmm. what I wanted to pull together was half a dozen Native Americans who fit that description. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, I'm obviously playing on the idea we have yeah. in American history when we think of the revolution and the founding fathers, this galaxy of mm -hmm. stars, if you like, right. are instrumental. But I think if you look in Indian country, you and you can find similar people. And so I include oh, yeah. Joseph Brown and I include Samson Ockham, who would might be an unlikely candidate, but mm -hmm. he's a leader of his people. And he's a leader of his people, not in on the war path, mm -hmm. but in Christianity and mm -hmm. in, lit, in literacy and in education. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a remarkable individual. And he's uh, um, for, for people for people who don't teach at Dartmouth College. <laughs> um, Ockham is um, actually the co-founder of the college because mm -hmm. when Eliezer Wheelock is looking to raise money to establish what he called a school in the heart of the Indian country, what mm -hmm. became Dartmouth College, he hit on the idea of sending his star pupil, mm -hmm. Samson Ockham, who was a Mohegan, mm -hmm. to England to raise money. Now, there'd been lots of native people traveled to England before. Mm -hmm. um, Pocahontas and dozens of other people have been there before, but not a native minister. Hmm. Samson Ockham was a brilliant student. He was, um, he wrote and read multiple languages, uh, Greek, Hebrew, mm -hmm. Latin, as well as speaking several indigenous languages, but he was an endowed and ordained minister. Hmm. And he went to, to England and Scotland for couple couple of half years mm -hmm. and delivered two or three hundred sermons wow. but the idea was that he would be a kind of poster child for wheelock's mission to show what education what a christian education mm -hmm. would do, mm -hmm. uh, for a native person and he raised what was described at the time as a bushel of money mm 
which was mm -hmm. the seed money for, for Dartmouth College. And he had a falling out with Wheelock because soon after he accused Wheelock of taking that money and not using it for the education of Native mm -hmm. American youth as it was supposed to be done, uh, and instead just using it for white boys. Um, mm -hmm. And he had a point. Um, but at the time of the revolution, um, prior to the revolution, Ockham had been thinking about kind of creating a new Christian Indian community. Mm -hmm. And he thought about doing that with peoples from indigenous communities in New England, but moving them further west, moving them into what is now New York, where there would be less contact with colonial neighbors because Ockham and many other native uh, people understood that contact with colonial Americans was not the best place, to, the best way mm -hmm. to kind of live a Christian life. You know, right. There's a strong drumbeat of that criticism in, mm -hmm. uh, in native response. Um, and interestingly, at, at Dartmouth College just last year, repatriated the papers of Samson Ockham to the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut. Hmm. Um, they'd all been digitized, et cetera, et cetera. So scholars can still use those papers mm -hmm. at Dartmouth College. But the college after you know, 250 mm -hmm. years um, kind of woke up and said, it's not appropriate for these papers to be here and not there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was actually part of the delegation that went down and, and, and returned the, the, those papers, which, of course, are an important, huge part right. of the part of Dartmouth's history, but of course, they're a huge part of, of Mohegan tribe's history. Um, right. And I think that's an important reminder, of course, because every community, every Native community uh, was involved in the revolution have their own experiences and the Mohegan experience in the revolution was exactly opposite to the experience to the picture painted by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration right. of Independence. Mohegans fought on the side of the Americans and lost, suffered heavy, casual, heavy casualties. Most New England communities fought on the side of the Americans. Um, yeah. That's, it's a little bit uh, like I feel like peeling an onion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Just to get back to your original point about there being all these multiple different tribes. Yeah, yeah. Well, everyone's different. Right. Which is why I suppose 30 years ago when I was writing a book on the American Revolution in India country, I, I thought I have to do this in a series of, I think I did seven, maybe eight case studies. Yes. And yeah. that's scratching the surface. Yeah, it, it's really amazing how different these are and how each one has to be approached on really its own terms as you were saying earlier looking out from what was their center which, yeah uh, absolutely and i think you're i think the way you put it is is really the only way to do it otherwise we risk the danger of just glossing it over and yeah. presenting this in as a kind of monolithic experience which yeah, is yeah there were certain, certainly some shared experiences, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it's a question of diversity. It really is. Yeah. Great we, we have been talking with Colin Calloway. I, you know, we could go on and we could spend every session with you talking about a different experience, but I know you, yeah. have, you have a life and other things to do. So hopefully we can talk to you again at some point. We've been talking with Colin Calloway. And your most recent book, which you mentioned, is The Chiefs Now in the City. And, and um, The First Peoples is the survey you're working on a new edition of. And mm -hmm. um, so, and, we, and The Indian World of George Washington. Again, thinking about American history, um, looking at it from a different perspective, it's really a not only to learn the history of native people, but to think about how we tell the stories or how we understand history from these different perspectives. So thank you for joining us, Colin. Thank you, Bob, it's been my pleasure. And I wanna thank Jonathan Lane, our producer and our
many friends. You know, we, we thought we'd have a handful of folks listening in, but we actually have a pretty steady group of listeners really around the world. And every week, I think some of them in different places. And some will be places known to you, um, Pensacola, Florida, where Alexander McGill Gray spent a good deal of time mm -hmm. at over New Hampshire. Uh, Mashpee, Massachusetts, Council Bluffs, Iowa, Indianapolis, Indiana. Thank you all for listening. And if you're one of these places, send Jonathan Lane an email, jlane at revolution250.org, and he'll send you some of our Revolution 250 gear. And hope to see you again soon. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.